feel like somebody should say something. I can say a little. I'm something. going to kill Cormac. Just thinking more like a prayer. Hey, welcome back to Screen Crush. I'm Ryan Airy, and this is all the Easter eggs, references, and little things you missed in the second episode of The Continental. But first, we got to talk about what you guys said about the last episode. Who, me? No, Doug. Them, the viewers, you guys. In our last breakdown, several of you theorized that Frankie is actually John's dad, and honestly, that is a brilliant theory. For starters, the timeline matches perfectly, and Keanu Reeves certainly looks like he could be their child, 40-ish years down the line, and he is of European and Asian descent. This would also make Winston John's uncle, which not only justifies his relationship with John, but adds a potential new layer of depth to some of the film's moments. Like when he shot him off a roof? <laughs> oh yeah, big time. It's a great theory, we love it, and thanks all of you for watching our coverage of this show. So, the second episode starts off just like the first, with a flashback from little Winston and Frankie. There's people in there. So we can indeed confirm that it was arson that put them in the legal hot seat they were in in the last episode intro sequence that we saw, as they light the same cocktail in the first frame of episode one. As we jump back to Winston, just before he cremates his brother, he's holding some important items. More specifically, a coin, his brother's dog tags, and his wedding ring, which forms a trinity, because we all know how the Wick world loves its religious symbology. It's a triad of the three things Frankie served, his wife, his country, and the high table. Then there are a few subtle changes to the intro. The banners in the dojo now read loyalty in both Japanese and English, whereas in the first episode they read sacrifice. Additionally, the posters in the scene with the red Mustang have also changed from this close-up shot of an Asian woman, possibly Yen, to this one, again with the loyalty replacing sacrifice from the previous episode. Now, last time we said that this shot was a violin-gun hybrid, but since we can't see a chin piece for the violin, we don't really know the scale, meaning this may not even be a violin at all. It's possible that this shot could be referencing our cellist friend that we see playing later in the episode. Episode, crossed with a gun, foreshadowing his death. Wait, I thought he was beat to death with a golf club, not a gun. Yes, but there's also this line from Lou. With hand to hand, or any other weapon, you have a choice. With a gun, there is no choice, only death. So the gun symbology for death could work here as well. It's also worth mentioning the color scheme here as the whole John Wick franchise is big on specific color use. The intro is made up of four colors, red, yellow, black, and white. While black and white are mostly for contrast, both red and yellow have a specific context in this universe. Yellow symbolizes hope. In John Wick chapter one, scenes bathed in yellow were centered around things that either gave him hope or pleasant memories of the past. Scenes where he's remembering his wife, playing with Daisy, or even driving his car. Red, on the other hand, is typically associated with evil, which is why red scenes often signal bloodshed. Just like how the red party scene in the first episode led to our panic at the disco joke from the last breakdown. With that in mind, this shot of the gold mannequin shooting the red one can be taken as a sign of hope triumphing over evil. Then we get into the end of the intro, finishing with a stabbed roach, which of course we see later in the episode when Winston asks for the Bowery's assistance. Then we get yet another flashback, this time to Saigon in 1973, which features some really cool details. For starters, Yen's first husband, Warlord Thay Kang, is played by the Vietnamese action star Johnny Tri Nguyen, who is actually the real-life boyfriend of Kate Young, the actress who plays Yen. When she meets Frankie for the first time, he's wearing this green bandana, which is actually an homage to the one worn by Sergeant Barnes, played by Tom Berenger in the 1986 film Oliver Stone's Platoon, a movie that also featured another John Wick star, Willem Dafoe. When squad, you piece of shit. Hey, hold up, person. How do you know that just wasn't some kind of random green banana? Oh, well, Doug, I'm glad you asked, because this was actually one of the many details that we were able to discuss with one of the writers and co-executive producers of the show, Ken Christensen. This guy right here. He actually reached out to us after the last video and gave us some behind-the-scenes details, all of which we have included in this video and even some details for episode three, which is just unbelievably cool. We really appreciate you checking out our videos. It means a lot. Another detail he revealed to us about this scene is from the poster behind him, right above his head, which translates to your mom. He's also drinking a Vietnamese beer called Mboi Ba, or 33 beer, which we see again when Yen pulls out a coaster with the same logo on it later in the episode from her little box of Frankie's memories. After that, we head to the dojo. Lou gets in a fight with the orphan master, revealing a bit more of her backstory and confirming that he is indeed the guy who's been redecorating her windows with bricks. Focus on your business, not picking up broken glass. 
KD gets the call from the morgue saying that they have Frankie's body. And of course, it's not there because Winston's already cremated him. So she goes to interrogate Ezra, the pathologist. Now, this guy is obviously one of the cleaners for the high table. The cleaners are the people who clean up messes left behind by the high table assassins, specifically dead bodies and crime scenes. They are led by Charlie, the same Charlie we saw in last week's episode and whose trailer gets ransacked later in this episode. When KD enters Ezra's office, there is a very specific black leather jacket and hat, which is the very same one worn by the cleaners in John's films. After that, we move to a dinner with a schmuck, where we see Cormac served by the adjudicator. She starts off by giving him a coin, showing he is officially being adjudicated, just like the adjudicator will do to Winston in Chapter 3. Now, unlike that adjudicator, this one only gives Cormac three days, which is actually a reference to Judas, because Judas betrayed Jesus just three days before he was arrested and crucified. This is one of many times that Judas and Cormac are connected, but more on that later. Also, another detail we missed from our last breakdown is that our main muscle, this guy, is actually the showrunner for the Continental, Kirk Ward who is directly responsible for many of the Easter eggs and references that we have been obsessing over. Back at the dojo, Winston and friends make a plan to seek help from the Bowery. Now, when they discuss Maisie, Lemmy says, Like she's the queen pin of the criminals. Which makes sense since the Bowery King leads the Bowery in the films. I am the Bowery! But what's truly amazing about Maisie is that she's actually based on a real person. Maisie Gordon Phillips, also known as the Queen of the Bowery or Saint Maisie, was a movie theater owner and advocate for the homeless in the 1940s. So her name is more than just a clever title, and her Bowery is a bit different from the one we're used to seeing. In the films, the Bowery is more of a secret society, one that falls under the high table's power, but not by choice. But this high table shit. Now, while the Bowery King does a penance for his crimes at the high table, it never deters him from helping John, no matter how much trouble it gets him in. You ready, John? Yeah. Now, we've got to respect the needle drops in this scene. As Winston is waiting for Maisie, you can hear Magic Man by heart playing in the background. Specifically, which is exactly what he's trying to get Maisie to do. Right before Winston gets tired of waiting, he says, Because I don't eat my kind. Just before he stabs the roach we saw in the title sequence, and then he holds it next to his face, which gives us this weird sense of pressure as if he's actually going to take a bite. That's really gross. Now, when the twins are ransacking Charlie's trailer, the album Hansel is holding is Chris Christopherson's The Silver Tongue Devil and I. Wait, is that another reference to Taxi Driver? It is. It is the record young Robert De Niro gives his lady friend on their second date to the movies. We hear Can't Live Without You. Can't live if living is without you. As we transition from Cormac's crew tearing apart Charlie's trailer in search of the coin press to Yen looking at old coasters and pictures of Frankie in her theater hideout. When company arrives, she distracts them by playing Let's All Go to the Lobby, which is a very old animated short that used to be played before intermission, which is wild because this scene takes place about 35 minutes into the episode, making it not just the middle point of this episode, but the halfway point of the whole three-part series. I get it. After some entertaining theatrics from Yen, we're back at the rooftop with Maisie and Winston, the very same rooftop that John and the Bowery King will end up reintroducing themselves on years down the line. In fact, behind Maisie, not only do we see that she has her own pigeon coop, but we even see a young Bowery King holding his own pigeon. And that was confirmed to us by the writer of the show. I've only had Arlo for a day and a half, but if anything happened to him, I would kill everyone in this room and then myself. Maisie helps Winston escape the high table, just like the Bowery King does for Wick. So clearly, the apple doesn't fall too far from the tree. Next, we meet Cormac in the church, and after comparing himself to God, we can see a stained glass image of Judas behind him. Why would a Catholic church have a stained glass render of Judas? Well, it's not something you see very often, or ever really, especially with images of him unaliving himself after Christ's death. He also has pieces of silver falling from his hands, referencing his payment for betraying Christ, and his foot is on fire, showing his descent into hell. This is now the second time we see a connection made between Judas and Cormac, and it makes sense. Both Judas and McCormick serve themselves first and violently betray those they claim to love, as we see Cormac do at the end of this episode. What was it that Thomas was trying to steal? You. Yen and Miles attempt to snag a truck full of supplies, and Miles fills us in on some details about him and Frankie during the war. He ends with... Frankie and I sat over that radio and shared something I don't think either of us had ever experienced. A true moment of peace. Finding peace is a really hot topic in the Wickverse. In chapter two, after John pours Abram a drink and toasts to peace, he replies, And in chapter three, Winston says, See this back in Arabellum. And in chapter four, when John confronts the elder, he tells John, And the only way John Wick will ever have freedom or peace now or ever is in death. 
However, what makes Miles' story stand out is the fact that he's talking about a moment where he actually found peace, something John has constantly been seeking since he lost Helen. Then we move to a beautiful rooftop scene between K-Ron and his wannabe boyfriend. Writing to your father again? Yes. I was just telling him how brilliant you are. The same rooftop that John takes a tumble from when Winston shoots him in Chapter 3. Both Jenkins and Winston are watching them from across the street, and this time we see a new color flood the scene, blue. So blue scenes indicate that the protagonist is in control of the fight. A perfect example is the nightclub scene in Chapter 1. The entire frame is lit in blue every time John controls the scene. The fact that they are discussing a very high-risk, high-reward situation in this blue lighting means that their plan to convert K-Ron is more than likely going to favor the high-reward side. After K-Ron picks up a letter from the post office that looks a lot like his grave in chapter 4, we get to refocus on Lou and the orphan master. He orders chicken feet when they sit down. Lou replies, My Haitian grandma used to nail chicken feet to her door. Scare away the boogeyman. Oh yeah, of course. Referring to a common practice in voodoo, chicken feet are used for protection from evil spirits and nailing them to your door prevents spirits from entering the house. Dude, that was awesome. High five. Now they both bring up boogeyman since we know Wick's nickname, the Baba Yaga, the Slavic word for boogeyman. Now in Slavic tradition, the Baba Yaga is actually a witch who lives in a house that literally walks on chicken feet. The witch? After he steps off the bus, you can see a 1975 bright red 351 Windsor V8 powered two-door Gran Torino, which is actually the car from Starsky and Hutch. You want to crash the car into his boat? No. I want to land it on that boat. Now go. Man, this show and its car cameos. Right? But then again, it's John Wick, so what else do you expect? Last but not least, we have Cormac and the cellist. Now, as we mentioned last time, Cormac's room is filled with horses. The guy could give Ken a run for his money. Cormac surrounds himself with horses because they represent everything he's not, and he's constantly trying to compensate for it. Plus, the name Cormac literally translates to son of the charioteer. Now, of course, chariots are pulled by horses, which may be a subtle way to say that order, given to him by the high table, is what truly propels him forward. He carried, and his power does not come from himself. When Cormac asks our cellist friend to play the song representation of Karan's loyalty, he says, This is from Don Giovanni. The theme of the whole piece is loyalty to the master. But wait, that's not what Don Giovanni is about. You are absolutely right, Doug. Don Giovanni is an opera by Mozart, and it's the story about a young playboy who blazes the path to his own destruction, which is exactly what Cormac's doing by killing on the Continental Grounds. Now, while the adjudicator is choosing to ignore Cormac's business on the Continental Grounds, at this point, anyone who knows could use that against him and brand him excommunicado. Cormac ends the episode by kissing Karan on the cheek, which is clearly a Judas kiss. What's a Judas kiss? Well, Judas kisses Jesus on the cheek to signal him out to the Roman guards, which has become known for definitively foreshadowing some kind of betrayal. Now, despite this episode being a lot shorter than episode one, it packed one hell of a punch. The action sequences were incredible, and the small details and homages really allowed the spirit of the writers to shine through. Well, guys, that's everything we found, but we want to hear from you. What are your thoughts on episode two? Is Frankie John Wick's dad? Are there any details we missed? Special shout out to Dotson Sites, the writer of this video, and let me know your thoughts down in the comments below or at me at Twitter, at Ryan Airy. And if it's your first time here, please subscribe, smash that bell for alerts. For Screen Crush, I'm Ryan Airy.